Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. We'll look in a moment in chapter 5 from the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul had association with the church. It was uh, association really with the commercial city of Corinth uh, during his second missionary journey, and he spent 18 months there. And God blessed in a wonderful way, and, and uh, people were saved. Uh, the, when Paul was there, he left and went to Ephesus and then heard some reports that there were some problems within the Corinthian church due to different forms of division among some of the people as it's recorded in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. And uh, the Corinthians wrote a letter back to Paul and he uh, asking for some clarification on some issues and Paul mentions that in chapter 7 and the first verse and he responds by writing the letter that we know as 1 Corinthians. Uh, the book tells us that Paul planned to remain in Ephesus for a period of time, and Paul sent Timothy to Corinth, and while Timothy was there, he heard that there were some difficulties, some false apostles had come into the church, and they were trying to spread false doctrine, and that was a, a great concern to Paul, because in doing so, they had to tear down uh, the credibility of Paul, and that, of course, was great concern to him. So Paul abandons his work at Ephesus, and 2 Corinthians tells us he went to Corinth, and, and uh, in the second chapter it talks about the painful visit that he had there, and, and it didn't have a great deal of success in that visit, and so from there he, he sends Titus to go to the, uh, send a letter to the church, and it was a severe letter, the scripture says, and, and while he was there, uh, Titus, Paul was anxious to see what was happening in the church, and he meets Titus in Troas. And while he's in Troas, Titus gives him some words of encouragement that the church had repented of their, of their sin and some of the, uh, the harsh words they had for Paul and some of the rebellion they had. So, but Paul being wise enough to know that under the surface of, of the repentance with some, there would still be the smoldering of, uh, of rebellion. And so Paul then writes the second letter that we know as 2 Corinthians. And in that letter, he defends his apostleship in order to contrast what the false teachers were saying about him. He expressed the joy that he had in their, in their repentance. He encouraged them in giving the 8th and ninth chapter, the depth of, of what he was saying, and then he confronts the false teachers. But in the middle of all that, all that he was doing in the 5th in the chapter of 2 Corinthians is some, is some tremendous uh, doctrinal truths that the Apostle Paul is dealing with. Now, look in verse 1. That's not our text, but let me just touch on that for a moment. For we know that in our earthly house, this tent is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So he talks about our earthly home as being a tent. Now we know a tent was something that the pilgrims would use, and a tent was something that was temporary. Death was speaking about leaving the tent behind, and the tent is, is then taken down or destroyed in death. The body goes to the grave, but the spirit and the soul uh, go with the Lord. So Paul opens this thought with the, with the idea of the assurance that our earthly house should be destroyed, and it will be destroyed. But he says that we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, that's eternal in the heavens. So he makes the distinction between a tent and between a permanent building. So the tent, this body, is going to pass away. But the permanent house, the permanent building, will live on forever in eternity. And in that permanent home, there will be no disease. There will be no heartache and so forth. And, and that's the building we have from God. It's the, it's the one that God gives us in eternity. And then he says this. He said, it's a house not made with hands. Now, why did he say that? Because we know this body, this temporal tent that we live in, is not made with hands. So what is he talking about? And it's in the understanding of that phrase, a house not built with hands. Literally means not of this creation. Now, how do we get that? Over in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, it says this. But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not this creation. Because of that, some people and many people believe it was Paul that wrote the book of Hebrews because of the terminology, though that is not uh, a fact that we don't know because the Scripture doesn't say it. So what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, he said, our present bodies are suited for this life on earth. 
But when this life on earth is done, that's gone. Our glorified bodies are not of this creation. In other words, they will live forever. They are designed. The eternal body, the building of God, the body is designed for life in heaven. And that's the future of the believer. He talks about the eternals in heaven. Body no longer subject to disease or decay, but eternal in heaven. Then down in verse 6, he says this. So we are also confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. He's saying, all right, we're in this flesh. We walk by faith. We can't see what the eternity holds. We, we believe it because the Word tells us. But we walk by faith, not by sight. And then he says, we're confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We leave this body, we leave this tent, we have our presence with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. So he said, this is our desire, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Takes care of soul sleeping that some people believe. Absent from the body, there's no soul sleeping, there's no uh, a time uh, of, of uh, non-existent, but he said, absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. And then I want to begin this morning in verse 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it's good or whether it's bad. He said we, talking to believers, we, the unsaved, stands before the great white judgment throne. Believers stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He says, we shall appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Literally, the scripture tells us, the things that we've done are made manifest. The judgment seat of Christ reveals our life of service for Christ exactly as it has been. Not as we see it, but as God sees it. Uh, Not only the amount of our service, or the quality of our service, but the very motive of our service. Again, the expression I use so often, Why do you do what you do? All that is brought out at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, after after, uh, uh, sin, we sin after our conversion, and that will have an effect upon our service, but a believer is not judged for his sin at the judgment seat of Christ. That's already been judged at Calvary. So that's already taken care of. But we're judged for our service. The judgment seat or the judgment of the believer's sin took place at Calvary. Then he says in verse 11, knowing therefore, the terror of the Lord. We persuade men that, are, that, that we are well known to God and also trust are well known to your conscience. Paul, Paul is speaking about this reverential awe that he has of God. And he says, I am I'm convinced, knowing the terror of the Lord, I'm going to be out persuading men. He said, now my testimony before God is real. And I'm an open book before God. And I pray as I'm open before God that I'm open before you. Paul said to the Corinthian church that well known in your conscience how I'm living. Verse 12, he says, For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but to give you opportunity to boast on our behalf uh, that you may have an answer to those who boast in appearance and not in heart. It's not the externality that Paul's dealing with, but it's the internal work. It's the working of the Holy Spirit within his heart. He said, we're not boasting about what we've done in the flesh. He talks about that in the book of, of Philippians. He said, but we, are, we, have a, we have an answer to the false teachers, because this is real in our heart. For verse 13, for uh, we are beside ourselves, it is of God, or if we're of sound mind, it's of you. Paul says, if I, if I look crazy, it's because he said, I'm doing that for the Lord. He said, I'm sold out 100% to God. He said, but sound mind, understand. He said, this is for you. This is for your understanding. For the love of Christ compels us. It motivates us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. It's the love that compels. It's the love of Christ that moves him on. Paul says, as I look at this marvelous love of Jesus Christ, as I understand everything that God has done for me, understand the hope that I have in Jesus Christ, With all of that, he said, I am compelled, I'm motivated, I move on because I want want to honor God. I understand his love. And he died for all, verse 15. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul's argument really is irresistible. The Savior did not die for us that we might go on and live any way we want to live. 
He didn't give his life for us that we can go ahead and, and do what we want to do. He said he's, he died for us and we're to live for him. We're to live under him. We're to live according to his law. We're to live as he wants us to. We're to live with Christ first and foremost in, in our heart. Verse 16, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we have known him thus no longer. Paul said we don't judge by somebody's work. There was a time in Paul's life, he looked at the life of Jesus Christ, and he judged him according to the flesh as an imposter. He said, but I no longer do that. Because I'm a believer, I know who Jesus Christ is. He's in my heart. Mere information about Jesus Christ cannot transform a person's life. It's not just in being informed about him. It's only conversion that takes an effect in a person's life. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Therefore, he says, because of all these things, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, a new creature, new making. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things become new. No one could, could reflect upon the transformation any more than Paul could because of what he was and what he had become. He says he was in Jesus Christ. And because he's in Jesus Christ, I've been made a new creation. And this new creation is brought about by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Spirit of God drew him, and he was regenerated. And God's work, creative work, began in the Apostle Paul and begins in the life of every person that puts their faith and trust in Jesus And we see the culmination of these new things in Revelation chapter 21 when the Bible says that he, when God makes all things new for us. That's the teaching of the scripture as far as I want to go with that this morning. But what does it mean to us? What can we take from this whole idea of verse 17 that tells us that we're in Christ and we're new? We're a new creation. What does that mean? How are we new in Jesus Christ. Let me give you a number of things this morning. Now understand this. It's important to understand that this verse does not describe a believer's practice, but it describes a believer's position. And because we have the position in Jesus Christ, therefore the practice needs to follow. And that's exactly what Paul's saying. What do we have? First of all, we have a new perspective. If any man be in Christ... He is a new creation. The Greek grammar of new creation indicates that it's the newest in a continuing condition of fact. It's a fact that in Jesus Christ we are a new creation. But it is a continuing process. As the Spirit of God works in our life, as the Holy Spirit challenges us, this process continues daily as we yield to Him. The believer has a new spiritual perspective on everything in contrast to what he had before. I think of uh, what the Lord said. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom or the strong man boast in his strength or the rich man boast in his riches. But Jeremiah, 20, uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, but let him who boasts boast about this that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord. People like to brag. They like to brag about their college degrees or their latest promotion or the achievements of their family or the new home or the new car, the new clothes or the new whatever. And sometimes if our existence revolves around uh, what somebody else thinks about us, boasting is foolish because it it makes us think more than we really are. And and, uh, finances and prestige is not a measure of life it's not a measure of strength or a measure of wisdom but we have in Jesus Christ a new perspective of ourself in just who we are in God we'll come back to that thought in a moment we have a new perspective of God and what he's wrought within us there's a new perspective I think when we're in Jesus there's a new boldness that we have I think of uh, Daniel, Daniel in the uh, book of Daniel, and, and he's giving some prophecy down in the 11th chapter, and he's, in that passage of Scripture, he speaks about the difficult times and circumstances in the last days, and he says this, but the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. 
The people of God will come under intense persecution. And we see the beginning of that. Though we're, we're sheltered somewhat in our country, but we're still starting to see the, the beginning of some of that that's taking place and some of the restrictions and so forth. That, that the hate crimes, if you preach against homosexuality and so forth, just are, uh, that are on the verge of becoming a hate crime. Though in Canada, that's a law uh, that you cannot preach against that, even though the Scripture says so. But it's just an amazing thing as we think about the, the, the times in which we live. But notice what, what Daniel said. The people that know their God shall be strong, and they shall do exploits. Are we really, are we really allowing ourselves in our own lives to, to walk in such a way that we are allowing God to work through us that we can do those exploits? It's a testimony that you have for the Lord. How are you honoring him? We have some new boldness. There, we have a new evaluation. I think of what Paul said in Philippians. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count loss of all things for the, for the <coughs> loss of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, of Jesus Christ, uh, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and do count them but dung, garbage, that I may win Christ. Paul said losses and crosses don't really matter. The only thing that matters to me, Paul says, is knowing Jesus Christ. We talked about that last week. Is that really what matters to you, that desire to really know him? And then we have a new contentment in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all these things, he said, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us so. For I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, in case he forgot anything nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He said, this is the hope that I have. He said, I have a, a new contentment. I don't live in the old life. I don't try to be as the Pharisees did. I could boast in it if I wanted to. And he said, now that I'm in Jesus Christ, I live a new life. Some of you are struggling with some things in your life that you're facing some situations that are far beyond my imagination. I cannot understand even how you're going through that. Some of you are in the last years of your life. You think about some things the vast majority of people in this auditorium never think about at this stage in their life. But nonetheless, those things are there and they're real. But our contentment today is not in ourself. Our contentment ought not be in our bank account. Our contentment ought not be in the things that we have. Our contentment needs to be in Jesus Christ. And when we know him as we ought to, and we understand the truthfulness of the word of God as we ought to, then that contentment is real. Why do people today God, get so involved in drugs? And uh, why do they get so involved in whatever? Looking for something, something fresh, something different. Sometimes we get in our, in our life, we do this, do that, and, and we get in a, in a rut. And so there are things that we, we, we want more. But if our contentment is really in Jesus Christ, then the things that are so alluring out there in the world, the things that try to draw us, whether it be drugs or, or alcohol, whether it be pornography, whether it be whatever in your life, the things that can draw, if our contentment is in Jesus Christ, then our contentment is in ourself, our contentment is in other people, our contentment is in our family, our contentment is in our friends, because we find the contentment wholly in Jesus Christ. And that becomes our hope today. I find something else. We have a new hu humility. Ephesians 3.14. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.10. That the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow. In Psalm 95.6. Oh, come and let us worship and bow down and let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. In Revelation chapter 4. Verse 9 and 10. When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sits upon the throne who lives forever and ever and the four and twenty elders fall down before him who sits upon the throne and, uh, and worship him who lives forever and ever. Revelation in chapter 5 in verse 6 he says the Lamb of God. And aren't, you, aren't you glad that we when it talks about the Lamb of God, it, it goes on in the fifth chapter, I see the Lion of the tribe of Judah as he's opening the book, and then it says, and then I saw the Lamb. We identify with the Lamb because the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world, and we identify with who he is. 
But he says in that, in that fifth chapter, saw the Lamb looking as it had been slain and standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And he came, took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat upon the throne in that fifth chapter. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 5 and in verse 13, in every creature which is in heaven or on earth or under the earth or such are in the sea and all that are in them. I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits upon the throne and the Lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen. The four, 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Falling down before the Lord Jesus Christ and understanding who he is and worship him forever and ever. Wednesday evenings we're going through the book of first peter and we talked about humility this last week and the word literally means not raising far above the ground i mentioned an illustration that when sydney and i were in japan a number of years ago the missionary took us to an elderly uh japanese woman's home and she uh, was in her 80s she had been through world war ii and we we came to her home and she met us and she got on her knees and she took her forehead and touched it to the floor and she turned around and we followed her into the rest of the home. The missionary turned and said, that's the greatest honor that you could ever receive. The farther they bow down, the more honor it is. And she took her forehead and touched it to the ground. When we honor Jesus Christ, we fall down and worship him, who is our God. And we understand all that he's accomplished for us and we worship him. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility involves not thinking of yourself at all. And when we are humble in the sight of God, it's not that I think that I am nothing, it, it, and I'm less than, than, than what somebody else is. It's thinking of the fact that I'm not thinking about me at all. It's all about God. When we say it's all about Him, it's not about us. Everything's about Him. And if we could think about how wonderful He is, how glorious He is, then we can understand how humble and what humility is. And we don't even think about being humble because we are humble because of the greatness of our God. And that's the power that He gives us where we understand. Over the years, I've come to understand there are really only two types of theology. First of all, there's big God and little me. And secondly, there is little God and big me. And that's how we approach it. I mean, it's going to be one of those two things. It's going to be that, that God is big and we're small, or we become big and the bigger we become, the smaller God becomes. When you come to the knowledge of God, big God, little me. But sadly for many believers, maybe most believers, it's just the other way around. It's big me and little God. You know, you know what the Bible calls the idea of managing God, the Bible calls it an idol. Because we have a God that we can, that we can manage. And man uh, makes idols because they want God to be one that can serve his purpose. And so God, I, I have this problem in my life, so you come to my rescue. And that's sometimes the only time that we ever think about God. It's when we have, oh, we, 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 we will come on Sunday morning, but we compartmentalize God. We compartmentalize him with, here's our job, here's our home, here's our friends, and here's God. And so we, we wind up and do various things, but on Sunday or whatever, here's God. But that's not the Bible concept of God. But God, if we understand big God, then God's involved in our home, our job, our friends, our family. God's involved in it all. We can't compartmentalize who he is. We understand that he's in control of it all. The God of the Bible is far bigger than we can ever imagine. And until we understand that, we're going to miss the truth of the word of God. To know him and to know him better. And until we understand that, we miss the purpose of life itself. It's not the idea that I can go out and do what I want to on Monday because I've been to church on Sunday. It's the idea because I've been to church on Sunday and I'm reading the Word of God on Monday and reading on Tuesday and Jesus Christ is part of my life Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday as well as on Sunday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and all this is involved in my life and my walk with the Lord. But we compartmentalize about who God is. Jimmy Baker, some of you may remember him. 
and uh, he, had, he, he built people out of all kinds of money. He wrote a book. He was sent to jail, wrote a book, and his book was entitled, I Was Wrong. And in there, in, there are many things I disagree with him uh, even now, but there was, there was one thing that he said in there. I, he said, God, God allowed me to go to jail because it was there I really started to understand just who God was. It wasn't until I got there I started to understand who God was. You know, if, if it is that important to understand who God is, then maybe we ought to pay attention or what will God do to us in order to get that attention. See, our problem is not that God isn't speaking to us. The problem is that we are too busy that we can't or we won't listen to the voice of God. I think of Hosea 6. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. That means that we have a goal before us of undiminished vigor. That we have this great desire, this knowledge of God, that we desire that that nothing can turn us away from Him. But again, we compartmentalize. I read a book several years ago, Tony Evans, Our God is Awesome. I I I quoted from him last week. I took some statements out of there and just put it aside. Let me give you, read this, what he says to drive home that point. He said, I quote, I can't fully explain what it means to know God. I can use the terms, but it's like defining a kiss. Webster has the terms. He calls it a caress with the lips, a gentle touch or contact. If anyone has ever kissed somebody knows that a kiss is really much more than that. You can't fully explain it, but Lord have mercy when you get it, when it, when it, uh, it's good when you get it. But he said, I can't fully explain it. What it means to know God will feel like. But I know that, that you will like it when it happens, end quote. I can preach and you can listen, but you'll never fully understand until you begin to know God personally you cannot define fully an encounter with God but let me tell you when you get it oh boy there's nothing like it that encounter with the Lord and I'm talking about one time but those are encounters you have those mountain peak experiences not being a mountaintop all the time there's some valleys but there's those mountain peak experiences Psalm 34 8 taste and see that the Lord is good problem is we don't open our mouth wide enough to taste the goodness of God He said, open your mouth and taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Some of you have unsaved loved ones. You have unsaved friends. Is there enough of a difference in your life that they can see to desire what you have in Jesus Christ? Someday, if they never trust Christ as Savior, someday they will die in their sin and go to hell. Hell is real, so is heaven. And for eternity, among the things that they will curse will be you if you've not lived as you ought to in front of them. What about your family, your husband, your wife, your children? People make decisions. I'm not going to follow God. Come to church for a while and make a decision not to follow Him. Little children in that home grow up never hear about Jesus Mary have their own family not concerned a lick about the things of God and that dad or mom may have put their faith and trust in Christ and fallen away from their walk with the Lord maybe got back I don't think you're going to fall away forever I think the Lord will draw you or take you home but, but you, you get back with him and those children and those grandchildren don't know Christ as Savior All of eternity, why didn't my dad, why didn't my mom tell me or live it before me to see the difference? One final word, am I done? You may be thinking, I don't know the Lord at all. Well, this is the time, the opportunity to trust him. Christian, unbeliever, it's all a decision that you make. Am I going to follow Jesus Christ today? Am I going to make that my decision? Some of you as believers may be struggling with sin. And you can say, eh, I can get over it myself. Ain't going to happen. I've told you the story before. <clears throat> it was, uh, I don't know if it ever happened or not, but it's, it illustrates a tremendous point. During the Civil War, the plantation owner in his white suit came to one of the black slaves who was a believer and knew there was a difference in his life. Said, what do I, what do I need to do to get saved? 
And the black slave said, you see that, you see that mud puddle under that fence? He said, if you want to go to heaven, <clears throat> he said, you've got to go and crawl on, on your belly and get under that fence through that mud puddle, and then you go to heaven. And the man said, okay, if that's what it takes. And the slave stopped him and said, no. You didn't have to do that. You just had to be willing to do that. And the point is, if you are going to repent of your sin, if you're an unsaved person repenting, if you're a believer struggling with sin, if you're going to repent of your sin, the point is this. You have got to be willing to say, God, whatever it takes, I am so broken, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do to be right with you. Whatever humiliation it may be in my life, it doesn't matter, God. And the Lord says, well, you may not have to do that, but this is what you need to do. You know, the idea, we have to be broken before God. And if we're not, in 40, almost 45 years of ministry, I've seen where people have said, okay, I'll do that, uh, but they don't. And before long, they're back in their, their sin. But when you're broken, and broken, and really broken before God, because you know who He is, and you understand who you are, and there's no humility, and you're broken before God, then there's repentance, and there's uh, a renovating life that God has resurrected again for His service. Do you know Him? Are you trusting Him as Savior?